Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Some of you guys need a Holy Spirit jump charge like I do. So I want to know if Keith stole the bell. Um, <laughs> oh, I knew it. <laughs> this is the first time I was looking forward to getting my bell rung. Man, I never trust a guy in a yellow shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, that didn't work. <laughs> There's money up here. It's a million dollars. I call it. <laughs> That's my son. Alrighty, well, how many of you guys have heard of the impossible gospel of Mormonism? Okay, turn it around. How many of you have not heard of it? One guy, really? Awesome. Okay, well, I'm here for you. <laughs> no, actually, this is being video recorded, so uh, people on the internet are going to be able to, to check this out, too. Uh, what we have been doing uh, the whole couple of weeks while we've been here is uh, we each get only get a half an hour. So what normally takes me like three hours to get through, there's no way I'm going to cram it into a half an hour. So I'm going to try something completely different. Uh, what I'm going to do is go through the impossible gospel without the outline. And I'm going to give you some ideas of how to use what you learn in the impossible gospel without necessarily having your scriptures available to you. Um, because there's, there's one problem that I want to address. Uh, but before I do that, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention. The ministries have been taking turns selling the book the new book, uh, Sharing the Good News with Mormons. Today is my day. So they're for $15. If you are interested in the book, uh, my table is right around uh, the corner there. I've also got t-shirts on there. And we've also got prayer magnets. So every time you go to your refrigerator, you can see my family and pray for us. That would be great. And we've also got a newsletter that we have titled Backpacks and Briefcases. Anybody know why we've called it that? Why is that? Missionary backpacks and proof of life. That's how you can figure out who's at your door. Because the missionaries have what? Backpacks. Why? Because you can't ride a bike with a briefcase. And the JW show up with a briefcase. So it's a free monthly newsletter that we send out. There's no obligation. All we ask is that within a year you let us know that you want to continue receiving it. And you can do that either by a donation or an email or through Facebook or whatever. But we just want to know that you still want the information. So, by the way, my chapters, uh, the last chapter starts on page 283. And uh, I have flipped through this book. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. But a lot of the authors I know personally, and I've heard their teaching approaches in the past. I'm really looking forward to Joel saying this morning, I don't want to steal his thunder. But he has a very unique way of showing people their sin. And the only hint I'll give you is it all adds up. Okay, so uh, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, one of the things that we that I wanted to cover uh, this morning is kind of how the approach really not really how the approach started, but how it got titled. Um, people often I've been called the impossible gospel guy. I'm not the one who came up with the approach. Uh, so I want to give you a little bit of history in that before we get into uh, the rest of what I have to say this morning. But Becky and I started coming in the year 2000. So this is our 19th year in a row. And uh, in 2001, we were staying in the park in Manti. And some unknown guy, I don't know his name, I've only seen him once. Uh, he was, I think he was from Arizona. We were sitting underneath one of the trees. Uh, there, was a, there was a tree there that's no longer there now. Uh, but there was a, a bench there, and he was going through the book, Miracle of Forgiveness. And he starts showing us these, us these quotes, particularly on page 164, and I think three, 365 is another one. But I couldn't believe some of the things that I was reading in this book. Because at that time, our, our ministry was more focused on the Jehovah's Witnesses than it was the Mormons. So I'm learning how to witness to Mormons. And I'm going through these quotes, and it's like, oh my goodness, there's, there's no way that this is possible. So, I mean, I did a really dumb thing. I went up to, I went up to Bill McKeever, and I said, did you know this about Mormonism? 
you don't do that with Bill McKeever, right? He says, oh yeah, well, uh, I, we've got that approach. It's called uh, the Celestial Law. It's on our website. So I went to his website and I looked up his approach and then I talked with Timothy Oliver in the back, raise your hand, former Mormon. On his left side is Tim Martin. Yeah, that one right there. And uh, so I talked to those guys too and each of them had different quotes that they liked to use either out of the Book of Mormon or their Doctrine and Covenants or, or other standard works. Uh, so I kind of put everything together and Chip had asked me to speak the next year and I didn't really know what I was gonna speak on so I started pouring through the quotes and the information and finding my own quotes. That's why we call our ministry Evidence Ministries, is because I want to go, I want to do my own research. I want to go to primary documentation and not just listen to what critics of Mormonism say, but I want to hear what Mormons say about Mormonism. So I started pouring through their things and, and I put it together in an outline that made sense to me. I'm a very uh, logical thinker. Um, some people, have, have you guys ever heard of people who, who are black and white thinkers? Okay, I don't prefer to, be, to look at it that way. I see it as, I, I, I teach by contrast and I learn by contrast. My two favorite words in the English language are but and not. Okay, this, not that. Yes, but with this nuance. So that's just kind of the way I think. So as I'm going through and creating my outline, it occurred to me, this is impossible. Nobody can do this. And then I put it together, it's like, but this is their gospel. What does the word gospel mean? Good news, this is not good news. This is an impossible gospel. And then it just kind of stuck. I thought, that's a really good title for this approach. So although I did not create the approach, I named it. So even the guys who have done this longer than, than I've been in ministry, uh, even they're using the title, The Impossible Gospel. So when Chip wrote his book, he asked to have the, the outline put in his book, and then it, it kind of took off from there. And then Eric, and by the way, thank you to Eric Johnson for allowing my wife Becky and I to participate in this book. We are really looking forward to what God's going to do through it. Uh, but he, he honored me with, with the task of writing the chapter on the impossible gospel. So that's kind of the history of the approach. Uh, what I want to talk about now is, I guess I want to say the biggest problem that I see people who try to use the approach. And, and I've kind of put it into two words, really, is people are treating it more like a presentation than they are a conversation, okay? That's a very important distinction. What I'm doing now is presenting, okay? This is pretty much a one-way deal. But when you're witnessing to a Mormon, it shouldn't be that way unless you're doing open-air evangelism or something like that where you've got a limited time to get a certain message out. But if you're talking to one or two Mormons, that should be a conversation. Don't rush through the outline. There's nothing special about the outline. There's nothing special about the order in which the verses appear in the book. In fact, the verse that I usually end with, or the chapter that I usually end with, is Alma chapter 34. There are times when I start with Alma 34, depending on what I hear the Lord telling me as I'm witnessing to this person. And, and pray your way through conversations. Uh, again, it's not a presentation. Pray your way through the conversation. There are times when I've got a mental image of a red light and a green light. There's no yellow. It's just a red light or a green light. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit to lead me and to guide me. Do I say this? No, I don't say this. Do I say this? Green light. Yes, I go in that direction. I often pray my way through conversations as I'm listening to the Mormon. And I do a lot of listening. Again, this is not a presentation. It's a conversation. You want to talk to them. You want to hear what's important to them. The Mormon will tell you how they need to be witnessed to if you've got the ears to hear. They will bring up certain questions or certain points that you can then address. And based off of the things that you say or that they say, you can then steer the conversation in a direction depending on what verse applies to that particular statement that they've made. So my biggest encouragement to you guys 
is, you know, once you get the book or Chip's book that's got the, the original outline in it, treat it like a conversation. This is a real person that you're speaking with. And if they, they uh, you, you've heard the statement, people don't, um, they don't, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You guys heard that before? That's really true. So when you're having a conversation with people and you're asking questions and not necessarily trapping questions, but you're asking clarifying questions. What do you mean by that? Can you define this term? Sandra Tanner has once said, if you ever find yourself agreeing with a Mormon, somebody hasn't defined their terms. All right, so you've really got to do a good job of defining your terms. Um, so getting into how to use the approach with actu without actually using the outline. I was up here, uh, I was up in the Salt Lake area a few weeks ago, uh, had met with uh, the MRM guys. There were some things I wanted to talk with them about ministry related issues. And on my way home, I'm sitting next to uh, somebody that I think is a Mormon. I'm not sure if he is or not. So how many of you like small talk on airplanes? <laughs> a few. Okay, how many of you don't? Let me see those hands. All right, that's a lot more hands. The easiest way to get out of any conversation in an airplane, in an airplane earbuds. Turn your iPod on, your phone or whatever, and, and they know not to mess with you. Well, this guy didn't have earbuds, so guess what that meant? That meant I'm going to mess with him, right? No. So I, I try to have a conversation with him. I say, so are you from the area? Yep. <laughs> Do you live in San Antonio? What's your final destination, San Antonio? Do you live there? Yep. <laughs> what do you do? Military. As you could tell, this is a really talkative guy. <laughs> and and so, I, you know, so I figured out, okay, so he's from the area. All right, so you're from the area, so you're LDS? Yep. I'm thinking, okay, I'm still not seeing earbuds. <laughs> you're fair game. So what question do you ask next, right? So did you serve a mission? Yep. Where'd you serve? Arizona. What was the average day? I'm thinking, I want to I want to I want to ask a question that he just can't answer yes or no to. What was your average day as a Mormon missionary? Yep. <laughs> he can't say yep to that. So he starts telling me how they get up at 6:30 in the morning and then they do exercise and you know they do all these things. And he goes out and and uh, and and he mentioned that they preach the gospel and talk about forgiveness. And I turned to him and I said, forgiveness of sins. Now, that's a topic that interests me. <laughs> Have you ever had the experience when you're looking at somebody and they're looking back and nobody's saying a word, but you know what each other is thinking? <laughs> that's what happened on the airplane. He's looking at me going, are we really going to go there? <laughs> and I'm looking back going, you betcha. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I said, so what do you teach people when you're going door to door on your mission? So he starts going into the gospel and I'm waiting for him to bring up my verses, right? You know, the six different verses we've got in the book that talk about the impossible gospel. And he does it. And it's like, okay, Lord, I'm off, I'm off the script on this one. How am I going to redirect this guy to talk about forgiveness of sins and with the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine of Covenants and different things? How am I going to, to, to get him into that? So I started asking a lot of clarifying questions. And questions are very, very important. They're great tools that you can use to open up dialogue. And it's great because you don't give them the answer. They're giving you the answer and you're asking more. Yeah, bless you, whoever sneezes back there. And you're giving, or you're, you're asking questions and they're giving the answer uh, which is basically telling you which direction to go and how to witness to them. So this would not have worked if I would have, because of how talkative he was, if I would have opened up my, um, my scriptures on the iPod or my iPad and started going through, he would have immediately shut down. But by asking questions, and I felt like I had the Holy Spirit jumpstart him into this conversation, 
he leads me exactly where I want to go. So he starts explaining what is required of us before we can be forgiven. And I like to use illustrations. And, uh, and based off of the things that he was telling me, I said, well, this is what it sounds like to me. Correct me if I'm wrong. But it sounds like, um, and I'm old school, okay, 80s back, you know, the arcades where you actually went to a place to play video games. You didn't have to play, you couldn't play them at home. Uh, and I said, so it sounds like to me that I'm in an old school arcade. And Jesus takes the, and sometimes I use the word coin, sometimes I use the word quarter, but most of the time I use the word token. Those of you who really know Mormonism know what I'm talking about. So Jesus takes the token and he puts it in the machine and then I've got to play the game. And I've got to play the game well enough to win. And he says, yeah, yeah, that's right. And I said, well, I know you can't give me a number, but I'm a real practical kind of guy when it comes to these kinds of things. I want to know how many points do I need to win? And he kind of thinks about it for a little bit. And based off of the other things that he was saying about what's really required of us, two words jump into my mind. And I said, all right, I, I got to clarify what you're saying. I want to know which of these two words best fits what you're trying to describe to me. And the two words I'm hearing you say are example and savior. Which one? Because in my mind, they're two different things. Because Mormonism teaches that Jesus is our example to follow him so that we can get what he has. He doesn't actually save us from anything. He makes us savable. He gives us grace to help along the way. But the grace that's sufficient for forgiveness of sins, he withholds until we do our part. So I want to know, how many points do I need? And we begin talking about that a little bit. And then he says this statement. He says, nobody gets out of the game alive. And when they say statements like that, I like to repeat that so that they hear me say that, so that they can actually hear how disturbing that really is. <laughs> And I said, nobody gets out of the game alive? <laughs> and he says, yeah, you really, you really can't earn enough points to win the game. That comes afterwards. Jesus has to add the rest afterwards. And I said, so nobody gets out of the game alive. You can't give me an amount of points that I need to know to win and it sounds to me like the game is unwinnable and he says oh you're just looking for an out you're looking for an excuse I said oh no 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 you don't know me if I have to earn enough points and I specifically use that word earn if I have to earn enough points to win this game I will play this game in a way unlike anything you've ever seen before I'm not looking for a way out I just want to know if the game is winnable. And if the game's not winnable, I'll find another game to play. And he says, you know, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. He says, but I've got a verse for you. And I'm thinking, great, he's going to go to one of my impossible gospel verses, right? <laughs> he doesn't. He goes to a verse that, now I've, I've read the Book of Mormon, I'd like to say that I've read it from cover to maps, but I can't. <laughs> of course, I didn't tell him that. But he takes me to 2 Nephi chapter 31, verse 16. All right, 2 Nephi 31, 16. And it reads, And now, my beloved brethren, I know by this that unless a man shall endure to the end in following the example of the Son of the living God, he cannot be saved. Which word did he use? Example or savior? Yeah. Example. I got to do what he did to get what he has. And I looked at that, and, and again, I'm going to read this back. And I said, unless a man shall endure to the end in following the example of the son of the living God, I can't be saved? And I went, ouch. And then when I say that, he, he's, he's taking another look at it like, well, I've never read it that way before. And all I did was just read it. 
But I've got to endure to the end. What does that mean to a Mormon? I've got to do what Jesus did. What did Jesus do? He was perfect. I've got to endure to the end in following that example or I can't be saved. I'm looking for another game because this game is unwinnable. It's not an excuse. I'm not looking for a way out. I'm asking him to define his religion. He's telling me what he believes and what the Book of Mormon teaches. And I'm saying, this is an impossible gospel. I can't do this. And I don't know anybody else who can. And he says, well, actually, let me change the illustration. He says, really, when Jesus puts his token into the machine, that's kind of like your baptism into the, the true church. So he starts talking about the priesthood and how they really only have the, the power to live God's commandments. And I said, but do you know anybody who's actually doing it, living the commandments faithfully? And he said, well, not completely, no. And I said, then how does what you have help you? What you're telling me is I'm not even in the game. But by not being in the game, you're in the game. But you're no better off than I am because you can't keep the commandments either. So we begin talking about keeping the commandments and he starts talking about repentance. And of course, repentance is a huge part of the impossible gospel. The bottom line of repentance is that you have to forsake sin before you can be forgiven. Now, of course, I'd love for him to go to DNC 58, but he doesn't. So we continue to talk and I'm asking more questions about repentance. And it occurred to me, well, actually, I've got a T-shirt that's on the back. It says, you can't repent if you can't keep the commandments. Now, that might seem like a kind of a heady statement, but let's boil that down. I asked him this question. If you can't keep the commandments, but you're taking solace in the idea of repentance, yet the end goal of repentance is to keep the commandments, then how does repentance help you? And it was like I'd smacked him with a two by four across his forehead. He'd never thought of that. He literally looked down and says, give me a minute, I've got to find something. So he starts going through the app. By the way, if you do not have the LDS Gospel app on uh, either, you can download it in either Google, what am I, an advertiser for the LDS Church? Google Play or Apple, it's a wonderful resource to have because you can bookmark it and mark it up and that's what I use. This is it, what's in my book bag. This is it. So it's, it's, a, it's a great app. And of course, that's what he was using on his phone. So he's looking for more things. And he brings out, he finds this general conference address. Um, excuse me. It was from Jeffrey R. Holland in last year's October uh, general conference. And it's titled this. You're going to get a kick out of this. It's titled, Be Ye Therefore Perfect, eventually. And I looked at that and, and I, I totally wanted to laugh when I saw that, but I didn't. <clears throat> and he says, here, read this. So I go through it and I read it. And there's a certain part where he references, where Jeff R. Holland references Moroni 10.32. So when I get there, I look at the, the reference and, and, and I read the first part of it and I said, that's what I'm talking about right there. Let me read what it says here. Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him, ellipsis. Moroni pleads, love God with all your might, mind, and strength. Then, ellipsis, by his grace, you may be sick and you may be perfect in Christ. Our only hope for true perfection is in receiving it as a gift from heaven. We can't earn it. And I looked at that and I said, we can't earn it. I don't understand how he can say that because we've both used the word earn. I have to earn enough points by playing this game that I'm not even really in until I get baptized into your church. But I have to earn enough points to win. And he's telling me I can't earn it. I don't understand this. And that's not a fake question. I don't understand how he can say this. 
So again, he's looking at it with new eyes because I'm asking questions from an investigator's point of view and he's feeling the responsibility to teach me because he's the returned Mormon missionary. So he starts looking at this going, I, let me read this again. And he doesn't really quite know what to say. I said, you're either earning it or you're not. And I said, no, I've got, I've got two more words in my mind. Okay? Achieve, receive. Which one is it? I, I, want, I want to see this. I want to see you guys do this. What would be the posture of achieving? What would you do? Okay, I see this. I see this. What else? Oh, yeah. Okay, we see this. <laughs> Yay me, right? What is the posture of receive? This is what I'm seeing. One is going out and getting. Earning. Because you can. The other is receiving. Because you can't. Those are two big differences. Which is it? Achieve or receive? And he sees his, his, his Mormon apostle saying we can't earn it, while at the same time saying that we need to achieve it. Those are contradictions. I can't wrap my mind around that. And neither could he. I'm actually on the wrong... Here we go. So, again, which two is it? Or which of the two is it? Are you achieving something? Or are you receiving something? And he starts to talk about how he can achieve it, but it's got to be in the next life. It can't be done in this life. Now, I, at this point, I can't break out Alma 34. Because then he's going to get the impression that, okay, this guy knows more than he's letting on. And I'm just, I'm just going off of what he's telling me. So I ask him, so, so, so there's a time when we can do this in the afterlife. How much time do I have left, by the way? Seven or eight more minutes. Okay. 17 or 18 more minutes. <laughs> so... I said, let, let, me, let me kind of go back to the idea of repentance and keeping the commandments. Um, I, I, need, I need your help in understanding more about this idea of repentance. Because you're talking about it doing, you, you being able to do it in this life. But you're saying something else about in the afterlife. Is, can we do it in this life? And a lot of Mormons will say, yes. In which case, then you go to 1 Nephi 3.7, which basically says you can do it. And you ask him, okay, then why aren't you? And, and since he wouldn't go to 1 Nephi 3, it's bothering me, he won't go there. I just paraphrase what 1 Nephi 3 says. Is God going to give us commandments we can't keep? He says, oh, no. God's not going to give us any commandments we can't keep. And I said, okay, so the very fact that he's given us this commandment means that we can keep it, right? To repent, right? And he says, right, but we never will. I said, so we can do it, but we won't. And he said, right. I said, whose fault is that? God's for giving us that commandment that he knows we can keep that we fail to? Or our problem because we don't do what he knows we can do. And why would he give us something that he knows we can achieve, I'm using his word, that we can achieve on our own. Does God do that? Does, does God grant forgiveness of sins if you don't completely repent? No. Well, are you, are you done with your repenting? No. Then you're telling me you're unforgiven. I was wearing a shirt last night. It says that I've never met a Mormon who knows they're forgiven. I got that saying from Bill McKeever. Saw him one night on the street saying... Sir, I've never met a Mormon who knows they're forgiven. Are you, that, are you my first Mormon? And I thought, what a great idea. That's a t-shirt right there. So the next year, that was my shirt. If you can't fully repent, then you're not forgiven. So you're asking me to play this game that's unwinnable, that nobody gets out of alive, 
Jesus expects me to earn however many points, but you can't tell me how many points I need to earn. I'm not sure this is a game I want to play. I want to look for a game where I know the end goal can be received, not, not achieved, because I don't believe that it really has anything to do with me. In fact, I was having a conversation with my youngest son, he's nine. He was wearing the same shirt, you can't repent if you can't keep the commandments. And he, and he says, Dad, what does this shirt mean again? <laughs> so I explained it to him, that keeping the commandments, if you can't keep the commandments, and you're looking for repentance, but the end goal of repentance is keeping the commandments, then how does repentance help you? And he says, so basically they can't repent. From a nine-year-old. I said, yeah, you're right. They can't do what they say they're expected to do. Yet they take solace in the very idea that they can do that. How, how does that make sense? This is an impossible gospel. Last week, I was talking with a guy. In fact, um, one, of the, one of the other guys from San Antonio was talking to about four or five different teenagers. And I saw a guy who was about my age, but looked a whole lot older than me. He's walking up the street, and I knew what he was going to do. I knew he was going to try to crash this conversation. So I circled around to the other side of the group, and my, my friend Bruce is quoting something. He's like, and then this guy just starts firing a question. Boom! I mean, and it was aggressive. And I immediately, like, sort of did this and asked him a question right back. And then he directs his conversation to me. So Bruce is like this. <laughs> Goes right back to talking to the four or five guys he was talking to. So it wasn't that funny. Oh, because they know Bruce, yeah. <laughs> Bruce is that way. You don't shake Bruce. So I get into about a 45-minute conversation with this guy, and he's, he's mad. He's really mad. I could tell when he's walking up the street. So whenever I see a Mormon who's angry, I try to take it as a personal challenge to see if I can calm him down. And I managed to get him calmed down. And he was saying, I really don't understand why you guys do this. We really believe the same things. 90% of what we believe is the same. As long as we all have faith in Jesus, we're okay. And I said, faith. But the things that you've been describing about faith sounds different to me. And I said, now correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like you're saying faith is incomplete knowledge. And he says, yeah, faith is incomplete knowledge. And I said, that's not what I believe. So if we both say that we have faith in Jesus and one of them doesn't really have real faith in Jesus, that's a problem. I said, let me give you this illustration. It's a true story. It's based on a true story. There was a French tightrope walker named Blondin. And what he used to do was tightrope across Niagara Falls. He would do all kinds of crazy things. He would cook eggs on a tightrope. I don't know how you do that. How do you build a fire? I mean, I don't know. But one of the stunts that he would do is he would take a wheelbarrow and the manager would stand up and say, who believes that Blondin could take a man in the wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls? Everybody raises their hands. Oh yeah, we believe he can do it. Blondin then says, who will be that man? <laughs> hands go down. Manager gets in the wheelbarrow, back and forth. And, and Chad was his name. He says, well, wait a minute. That's not fair. That's not fair. Because the manager knows the tightrope walker and has seen him do this a hundred times. And he knows that he can do this. The crowd, who's only seen him do it once, they, they don't really know that he can do this. So they're at a disadvantage. And I said, correct me if I'm wrong, but here's what I hear you saying. You don't know Jesus well enough to trust him. And he stopped, and he looked down, and he says, you're right. I don't. So at that point, I was encouraging him. You need to get to know this Jesus that you can trust, because he is your only hope for forgiveness of sin. This is not something you can achieve. This is only something to be received. And Jesus is the only one who can do that for you. But yet it's so easy. People hear you say it's so easy but you can't do it. I'll end with this story. I had a, a chat message with 
uh, one of the LDS missionaries. And so I told her, I asked her this question. I said, because we were talking about the spirit world. I said, let's, let's just assume that I'm in the spirit world. I'm in a place where I can't help myself. And you're one of the spirit missionaries who comes to preach the message to me. What would you tell me? So she tells me all the things that I would need to know to accept the gospel of Mormonism. And then I can get out of spirit prison. And I said, but what would, you tell, what, would I, what would you say to me if I told you that that was too easy? That there was something I needed to do to get out of spirit prison? And she said, if you said that to me, I would tell you that you didn't have enough faith to believe in the power of the atonement. I said, bingo. If you are looking to achieve something you can't do, instead of receiving something that has already been done for you, then you don't believe in the power of the atonement, which can save you. The impossible gospel is just one tool that brings people to that realization on their own or with the Holy Spirit, brings them to that realization. So if anybody's got any questions afterwards, come up and talk to me. This is not an easy approach, but it certainly does get Mormons to think. So, thanks. Got my bell rung. <laughs>